One of the brilliant things about our amazing Outspan Orange is it's based on a classic Mini. And because they are so popular, it means that all the parts are pretty much readily available, but also you can get some performance parts for them too. And I've already upgraded the distributor to a digital one or an electronic one, which means it's going to be slightly more reliable. But as far as our flat spot is concerned, it could be caused by a problem with one or a combination of systems on the engine. It could be something wrong with the ignition timing. It could be something to do with the fuel air mixture. For example, the carburetor could be set up too lean or too rich, or there could even be problems with air leaking into the system weakening our fuel air mixture. There could also be a problem with the valve timing, or more specifically, the valve clearances, because if they're not set correctly, then the engine could be losing power, which would only exacerbate any issues with our flat spot. Now, whenever you set up an engine, you should always start with the valve timing, and you should always do it when the engine is cold, so we'll start there. And the tappets, as they're also known, live under the rocker cover, which sits on top of the cylinder head, on top of the engine. And on this particular Mini, to get to them, I need to go inside the car. The two bolts that actually hold the rocker cover on are really quite easy to get to, except that the airbox is a little bit in the way, so I'm just going to move that first to give myself a bit more access. And while I'm here, I'm just going to give myself a bit more room still. I'm just going to remove the fuel line off the carburetor. Okay, get that out of the way, and then also the vacuum hose to the distributor. Now, even though the bolts are undone, the rocker cover is likely to be stuck on because in between this bit of metal here and the head is a cork gasket and often over time they kind of stick almost like glue. So if I can just now get the screwdriver in there, just to, oh actually it's not bad, ease it up there, just do the same on the back if I can. Yeah, good, I think we might get away with this, just rock it around a bit. And then I give a bit of a wiggle. So there is our rocker cover. And with that removed, we can now see all the rocker gear. And it's quite easy to see you've got your four cylinders and each cylinder has two valves, one for the exhaust and one for the inlet. But what's quite interesting is actually these ports that come in from the inlet and exhaust manifolds are actually Siamese, which means that one port is used for two cylinders. So you can see this branch here off the inlet manifold means that then you've actually got an inlet valve here and here, but then you can see the exhaust actually got three branches, there's one either end and then one in the middle, which means that this one then is the exhaust valve, but then in the center you've got these two are exhaust, and then at the far end again, same situation, so you've got the inlet and inlet, and then the far one is the exhaust. So it doesn't really matter for what we're doing, but it just means you've got to be aware that each cylinder isn't exactly the same when it comes to the valves. Now the valves open and close at precise moments within the combustion cycle to let in the fuel air mixture and the exhaust out. And the rest of the time they're held tightly shut by those springs around the top of the valves. Now the opening and closing is controlled by the camshaft, the lobes lift up push rods which in turn lift up the rockers and then the other side of the rocker pushes down to open the valves. Now all of those metal parts expand as the engine warms up and of course that basically brings the rocker closer and closer to the valve. So we have to put in a gap to make sure that once the engine's up to temperature that tolerance is spot on. Now if the gap is set too large then of course the rocker might never actually quite reach the top of the valve and therefore not only is it going to be slapping around making lots of noise more like a diesel than a petrol but also it's actually not going to be able to open the valves for very long and therefore we're going to be down on power but equally if the gap is too little then effectively that rocker is always going to be pushing on the valve and therefore it might never actually shut and that would equally mean that all those explosions would escape and therefore you'd actually get overheating but also you might even damage the valves themselves so if the gap is too big or too small you're going to lose power from your engine and of course that could exacerbate any issues we have with our flat spot so it's crucial that those gaps are set correctly and regularly on this particular engine that's about every 6,000 miles something else to now think about then is that we can only do this 
at top dead center for each cylinder. And at top dead center, both valves would be shut, which means therefore you'd actually have that play in the followers because they're not really actually trying to force the valves into any position. And of course that changes through the cycle of the engine. In this particular engine it's one, three, four, two. So what I need to do is actually rotate the engine to make sure we've got top dead center on each cylinder and then I adjust the valve timing. And bear in mind with the spark plugs in position, of course, there's going to be some compression in there if my rings are any good, and that means it's going to be harder to turn the engine over. So the next thing to do is to remove the spark plugs to actually remove that compression. That's going to be easier to spin the engine over, so it's easier to get the engine into the correct position to do the valve timing. Now, interestingly, you can see there, looking at the colour of the smart plug, it's just a little bit too on lean side. It's sort of a little bit too dusty white. It should be a slightly more sort of golden brown colour, I guess. So that suggests then, or confirms the issue that our timing might be fine, but actually it could be more to do with the air and fuel mixture. But we'll carry on. Right, so now with the spark plugs out of the way, I haven't got the compression inside the engine resisting the rotation. So there are a number of ways we can actually rotate the engine to get the top dead center of each of the cylinders in turn. Now I could just put it in gear and then actually push the vehicle backwards and forwards. I could maybe just jack up one wheel and rotate that while it's in gear. That would also rotate the engine. From the inside, what I could do now, because it's quite easy to get to, I could either use the fan, which is a, frankly a little bit fragile, a little bit sort of flexible, or I could even use the fan on the alternator and actually directly kind of spin the engine around. So that's probably a very useful way. Or I could be even more lazy than that and just use the starter just by jabbing my little start button in here. So I could just spin it around and then get to the right position. But then of course I do need to get to the correct position. Now, by looking at the rockers, we know at top dead center, both valves will be shut. So as long as we can see that, we can maybe even feel that little bit of play, that gives me an idea that we're in the right position. But in fact, a better way would be just to disconnect the cap here, take that off there, and then I can just spin around that rotor arm. So again, at the moment, if I just spin it around a little bit more, to about there, that puts me into cylinder one. So that gives me an idea of where I should be. So that means we know that this one should be, if I just wobble the rockers, and actually what's interesting is they really should be actually at top dead center. I can also do another double check by putting something in through the spark plug port. And so I can definitely feel the top of the piston. So then I'm completely happy that I've definitely got to top dead center on cylinder one. So the next thing I should be able to feel that little tiny bit of gap on the rockers, that bit of valve clearance. So it should be on this vehicle 0.012 of an inch or 12 thousandths of an inch, 12 thou, or 0.3 of a millimeter. And at the moment, I have definitely got nothing. It's kind of interesting. That kind of tends to suggest that the valves, obviously the tolerance isn't quite correct. It's too tight, which means the valves might not actually be closing, which means we might actually be losing a little bit of power by the stroke, which is not great, but it's obviously a perfect opportunity to make sure that all of them are okay and then get them where they should be. So what I need to do is get myself a spanner and a screwdriver and there's a lock nut and a grub screw. So if I now just hold this roughly in position, undo my locking nut and now the grub screw is free to move. So then what I need is a feeler gauge. So I've got this at the right, so this is my point three. So I'm now gonna pop that in the gap here and I feel there's no room at the moment. Let's see if I can do a bit better. So just wind this back, back until I've got plenty of space and then I'm just gonna then gently, ever so slowly, kind of tighten it back up again. So effectively closing the gap until I can feel a light drag on that feeler gauge. So just literally, so you just know that you've got that tiny bit these two bits of metal squeezing the feeder gauge. And then I'm gonna try not to move that. 
And I'm going to do up my lock nut again and then I'll double check it. Because what generally tends to happen is it kind of drags that grab screw round. That's just pretty good. So that's all right. So now we'll go to the next one. And again, that's really jammed up there. So again, open it up so we can get the feeler gauge in the gap. It's a bit tight still. And it really is a fine movement. So you're just trying to go for that little, a little light drag. It really is a tiny number of degrees that you're going to be moving. If you go too tight, of course, you could actually then damage the feeler gauge, which is no good for the next adjustment. So just make sure, just go very gently and just make sure Got that nice light drag. Then again, I'll try and tighten up the lock nut with the screwdriver holding the grub screw in place. Like so. Double check it. Actually, that may be now a little bit loose. So I'm just going to go one more. Tiny bit tighter. <laughs> now it's gone the other way. So it's always worth double checking because even that tiny little bit of adjustment could be enough to make the engine sort of either slightly noisier or slightly less efficient. Right, so that's nice and tight. So I'm just going to double check and perhaps even triple check our gaps again. So they both feel about the same. Nice light drag, which means cylinder number one is now done. In fact, if I just listen, see now you see when I rock them backwards and forwards, you can hear a very distinctive tap and tap it. Now the thing about that is, of course, once the engine's nice and warm, then that gap's going to go away as everything expands. So we've now got exactly the right gap that we need for that. But if you think about the cycle of a four-stroke engine, suck, squeeze, bang, blow, right now, this is actually in the bang phase. So both valves are shut. Obviously, the rotor arm there is pointing to cylinder number one. It's distributing the spark to this cylinder. And so we're when it's basically going to ignite that fuel-air mixture that's been compressed, and it's about to then expand and push the piston back down again. Closely after that will be the blow phase, and of course that means that we're going to see the rocker arm here actually then push that valve into the cylinder, compress the spring, and that means the gases can escape and then go in through the exhaust valve. So if I just spin it around a bit more, there we go. You can see now the cylinder as it's rotating, the valve has been pushed down, the exhaust is escaping, so of course the next thing that's going to happen is it's going to start sucking. So it's going to try and get bring in the fresh new fuel air mixture through the inlet manifold. So that means we're going to see this valve open into the cylinder, but while the exhaust one shuts. So if we look at that, it kind of almost just swaps straight over. So you can see now that inlet valve is now in the cylinder. It's sucking in that fuel air mixture. And then, of course, it's going to squeeze. So it's going to close, and then the piston's going to come back up from bottom dead center and then crush that gas. And then you'll see also, if you look at the rotor arm, you can see it's just coming around to one and that means, again, we should be back at that top dead centre position, pretty much. And that's ready to start the whole process again. So it's quite interesting to see all this stuff actually moving. If we now turn our attention to cylinder number three, you can see that the exhaust valve is shut, but the inlet valve is open because, of course, that is on phase suck. So it's actually trying to suck the fuel air mixture through the manifold. And obviously, as the rotor arm goes round, as I spin the engine round, what's going to happen is that valve shall now shut and then put the rotor arm into top dead center. So just bring that round to there. So that's now top dead center at cylinder one. Now, interestingly, there's no movement at all in these again. So obviously, again, a good thing to fix. So if I just undo that and then wind back our grub screw until light drag. Keep the grub spoo still if I can. So just check 
check that again. So now, again, we've got great. So we've now got cylinder three is to tolerance, which is lovely. So again, we carry on. So now for cylinder four, so just spin it around. So we're going to wait for these now to go around. So we go to the next position on the distributor. About there-ish. And, well, actually, for some reason, these ones are pretty good. Right, so now you can see I can't quite get in there because of this part of the carburetor. So what I might do is just undo that. Equally, I could just remove the carburetor altogether, but I'd like to run this up in a second just to check the next part. Yeah, again, they're pretty hard, so pretty firmly in position. So I will now, again, undo things. Good, and the last one. Lovely. Smashing. So we now have all four done. So I can now replace the distributor cap. Okay, so dizzy caps on. So next thing we can put the rocker cover back on, but obviously I want to change that gasket, which is distorted before I do that. So get the old scraper out. Right, so now any signs of the old gasket have been removed and it's lovely and clean, clinically clean, possibly. And the main thing is making sure there are no scratches, there's no sort of gouges, there's no corrosion. It's just a lovely flat surface. Now the new gasket, it specifically states that I mustn't put any extra sealant on, so I won't. I guess the cork and the rubber composite should do the work. And then I'm just now going to pop on also cleaned rocker cover and I'm just going to spend a bit of time making sure that there's nothing caught in between the two but also little bits of metal that kind of hold it in place actually doing that job and it isn't getting caught or clamped or squished in anything other than the perfect position. Right and now we can just bolt it down. So the valve timing or the tappets are now done. The rocker cover is back in place with a brand new gasket. The next thing... Hello mate, how you doing? Hello sir, how's you? Yeah, not too bad. Long time no see. I thought I'd pop in and see how you're getting on with this. Yeah, you got time for a tea? Absolutely. Cool. Come on in. Hello mate, long time no see. Long time indeed. What have you been up to? What haven't I been up to? Well, that's a good question. I'm guessing you've been out in the sun, clearly. I've been working in the sun, obviously, yeah. I mean, but now I've been fixing American pickup trucks. Nice. Just yeah. random ones you find in the street? No, or? I've got a couple of friends um, they have got old 1967 Chevrolet pickup trucks. Cool. I've been changing suspension, mm -hmm. sorting out exhaust pipes, nice. servicing. Yeah, and then one yesterday, I was actually doing some tongue groove flooring in the back. Can you believe it? Not in the cab, in actually in the... No, in the actual loading area of the back. Okay. It's like a Chevrolet van. 
panel van. That's a panel van, not a pickup truck. No, the, I, the suspension was on the pickup truck. Right. And the next one was a Chevrolet panel van, which okay. I was doing tongue and groove flooring in the back. Oh, that's cool. But obviously after I'd already built the coffin. <laughs> I don't even want to know the rest of that <laughs> no, story. No. No, that's good. All right, so you've been very, very busy. Doing yeah, very busy, but it's nice, isn't it? Yeah. Good work. It Clean is hands. Kind of, it's easier you to know? work with. Some of the splinters, not so much, but they're better than metal splinters. Yeah, at least they're wood splinters. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what <laughs> have you been up to? I've been mostly working on an orange. Oh no. Really? I know, it's kind of crazy. Well, we're getting there, I think. It's just basically just, you know, it's one of those things where you just want to kind of finesse stuff, keep, keep yeah, okay. going and things. Yeah. And I think, just want it to run really right. And it's been eluding me. There's this kind of weird flat spot and it seems to be down to sort of, well, I'm guessing it's going to be down to some kind of ingress of air in the wrong places because I've just done the timing. That's going very nicely indeed. Okay. So now it's going to be ignition timing, sort all that out. And then it's just really just trying to chase down that problem, but obviously just getting everything right along the process so you know you've eliminated everything properly. So That's fair enough. Well, I think it's just taking a long time. Yeah, so the last time I think we had a, a chat was we were in the, uh, the boat a couple of weeks ago it on the was. Thames. That's right, yeah. So yeah. how is the boat? It's, well, it's still afloat. Yeah, which is good. quite good, that's kind of handy really. It does, it does kind of take in some water all of the time, but only very, very slowly now, which is kind of nice. But oh, that's, that's the good. joy of clinker, isn't it? So obviously having it in the water has helped. Definitely, yeah, well, it's the taken up. stayed swollen everywhere. Yeah, and the leaks. And I've actually, well, it's, at the moment, I think the reason it's taken on a bit more water right now is I've put some batteries in the back because I've added a little modification. I've actually added a little electric trolling motor. Okay. Made it look a little bit kind of retro just to make it look a bit more like the boat itself. And that's actually just tilted the sort of the balance of the boat. So now the stern is slightly deeper. So of course now those panels have to take up as well. But it's it's great because it means we can kind of poodle down the, the river, making all that kind of putt putt wonderful noise. And on the way back we can go in stealth mode, full electric. Oh, that's good. The bilge pump still doing its job? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> Interestingly, actually, we'll come to that because we've had a few people have commented on it. Got some top tips about that in a little okay. bit. In fact, I've actually been persuaded to enter our little boat into the Stuart Turner Prize competition at the traditional boat festival. Brilliant. So it should be quite good fun. We've got a fantastic day out, lots of traditional boats, classic cars, all that kind of groovy stuff as well. Yeah, I'd love to come to that. That's a great idea. It'd be a good day out. In fact, you can all come. It's going to be on the weekend of the 16th of July in Henley on Thames. Simple as that. It'd be fantastic fun. Yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, it'd be good. Now, actually, we should probably get on to some answering some okay. questions. We've got uh, a question here from Patreon Josh Durham. Now, he's okay. just bought himself a 1990 Thomas A35. It's kind of like a I guess it's a bit like a scooter, a bit like a motorbike, kind of halfway between the okay. two. And he's wondering, are we ever going to have any more motorcycle content? <laughs> I don't know, what do you reckon? Well, I think it's a good idea. Obviously, we had a little dabble with the monkey bike, yeah, which maybe, kind of had mixed results. Maybe we could get a full-size bike next I time. I think a full-size bike would be yeah, a great not, idea. Not like a micro bike. With a sidecar, without a sidecar? Uh, without a sidecar. Fair enough. Because okay. it's not... Get back I don't to want to go like clean again. I think it's quite, quite dangerous. What about a scooter? Bike. Well, a scooter would be quite, well, then we maybe get one each or something. That'd be quite fun. Yeah, we could have, yeah. Yeah, okay, well, we'll have a little look at that. In fact, thinking a good place to have a look, one of our sponsors this week is H&H, &H, and they've got a motorcycle auction that's actually going to be at the National Motorcycle Museum in Birmingham, and that's going to be on Wednesday, the 20th of July, and I think the viewing starts about 11 a.m., but the auction starts at 1 p.m. Now, have you had a little look at that? So I've, had, I've had a look, okay. yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm, a, I'm a scooter man. Right. I've always loved scooters, yeah, yeah. so I, I've seen a lovely Lambretta oh. 200 okay. on there for sale. Nice. So it's, it's, it's got a guide price, sort of five and a half to seven and a half thousand. Okay, and it looks like it's an orange and orange and white there, is it? Yeah, it's orange and white. I mean, it's pr pretty good. That's very lovely. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I had a little look through, and I've seen. Now this is a bit of an odd one because yeah. I, mean, I okay. think looking at all the vehicles, I don't really look good on a motorbike because I'm a little bit too full size for them. But there is something that's just caught my eye just because it's really quirky, right? beyond quirky. It's actually a bit of a disaster. It's a 1973 Aerial 3. Oh, I know. I know. It, yeah. It cost BSA when they built them two million pounds wow. to develop. I mean, it's a ridiculous vehicle. It actually has, so it's like a trike really because they have the two rear wheels are very, very close together. Only one of them's powered, only one of them's braked, which makes no crazy, but it costs so much money and they ended up with this ridiculous thing. And the best bit is the strap line was, here it is. Whatever it is. I mean, how are you ever going to sell anything with that? It's mad, isn't How's it? strange. But the reason it caught my eye, not because it's so awful, um, and there's probably very few of them left in the world, actually, but also it's named, I think, probably after a satellite that my dad actually worked on called Aerial 3 that came up and went up into orbit about 1967, fell out of the sky in about 1970, and this bike was actually being developed. I guess it started being sold in about 1970, so it must be around the same idea. So maybe that kind of spacey connection is what kind of informed that slightly odd styling. But there we go. So I may or may not bid on that bike, but I thought it was quite interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. 
Well, well also, actually, we're interesting talking about H&H. Remember that the Jaguar that they had auction? It was an XJC. It was a 1976, and the, all the proceeds were going to go to the Ukraine fund. Yep. Well, actually, they managed to raise £39,375. Fantastic. Pounds, which is that is really impressive. Yeah, and then also, on that same auction, they had a 1969 Ferrari 365 GT that had kind of been rebodied in this weird pontoon um, Fender Testarossa. Yep. And that got 393,000. Wow, that's incredible. Absolutely yeah, incredible. Money. But there we go. So there's some exciting stuff there. And in fact, they're now actually consigning right now for their next auction for cars, which is actually going to be on Wednesday, the 27th of July, at the Pavilion Gardens in Buxton. Was there anything there that you like the look of? Yes, yeah, so a 2002 Mercedes. Is Ben's SL55 AMG. Mm, okay. So that's the one that had the, the V8 supercharged engine. It sounds great, isn't it? It's Incredible car, and it's got a guide price of 18,000 to 22,000. Okay. And it's in silver, so I'll be looking out for that one. So as your birthday is coming up, are you going scooter or are you going to go for the Merc? Uh, probably scooter. <laughs> it's probably more within <laughs> my budget. Your, your youth. It's probably more in my budget. Yeah, fair enough. That's a good point, I suppose. Well, I've seen there's a couple of things there that I quite like. There was a lovely 1934 Bentley three and a half litre Tora, and it's a lovely two tone thing. Again, it's very deco, very sexy. But actually, there I think I'd probably go for the 1903 Auto Car Model Eight. So it's 12 horsepower, yep. so it's horizontally opposed twin cylinders. It's kind of like half a Beetle engine, if you like. And um, I mean, the guy who designed that car is obviously one of the very first kind of production vehicles in America. And he was one of the first sort of adopters of the spark plug for the petrol engine. I thought it was quite interesting. And um, it's got a three-speed gearbox and can manage anywhere between three and 35 miles an hour. And because it's 1903, it's eligible for the London to Brighton, which makes it very exciting. Fantastic. And it's got four seats so you can take your friends with you as well. So Fantastic. If you've got a classic car or bike you'd like to sell, then h and will help you with the consignment just by clicking the link in our description. Right then. So we've got another question here from patron Adam Bowden. Now, he's got a bit of a strange problem with his Porsche Cayman. It's a 2007 Porsche Cayman S, actually, and he's got an issue with the brakes. Okay. So when he first got the car, the brakes were never great. He was never really, really happy with them, but he's done a lot of track day stuff, and he goes around as the first kind of just to get the, your, your, your eye in, if you like, those yep. first early laps, and everything seems to be fine. Then you go out for a bit of a bit more of a rag, and then basically the brakes start to fade, and then when he gets it back to the paddock, you can see that the brake fluid is all kind of black. Yeah. And, and he, so he's worried he's cooking the brake fluid. And again, he, the other day, he actually bought some more DOT4 fluid. He then sort of topped up the brakes, bled them, did the whole thing all in the right order. So he started in the far corners, ended up at the front near the master cylinder, but also did the twin. We've got like two yep. circuits yep. on the front as well. So did all that all in the right order. And yet, having done that, the brakes were then fantastic, the best ever. Went out again, did a load of laps. Everything was fine after lunch went out again and then the brake fade happened again and then the brake fluid basically went black again and he's just wondering what is going on. So any thoughts? Well obviously if the brake fading is happening I think the, the brake fluid is, is obviously getting too hot. Yeah. So obviously it's being compressed. But it's Hence a Porsche. The, so, so only because he said he's got a friend who's got a similar car with all the same running gear, same fluid, yeah. same brakes and everything's fine it run, drives all day so it must be something else that's at fault here I reckon. So one of the things I thought maybe was that you've got dot three brake fluid, then it goes up to dot four, but now you can get dot five point one. Now dot five is actually slightly different. So they're all kind of specs, and each yeah, time you are synthetic base, isn't it? Exactly, that's the thing. So dot five is silicon base; it's actually usually purple these days. And then dot four, dot three, and dot five point one are all based on glycol. So that means that all the seals and stuff are okay. So whatever you do, don't put dot five into a car that normally has dot three, four, or five point one. But the 5.1 actually has a much higher running temperature than the dot four. So actually that would be the first thing I think I would try is just to try and upgrade that so that it at least eliminates that problem. But I think it must be something else because brake fluid doesn't normally behave in that way. And I wondered maybe it could be perhaps the ABS system because of course they do have them on there. And then that brings up two other issues because obviously with the ABS system, it's something that's not operating all the time. So perhaps when you're just pooping around the track, then you're not using the ABS and therefore everything's fine. But then maybe when you start really, really going for it, then maybe the ABS kicks in every once in a while. And of course, then if there's a problem with that, if the seals are broken or there's some issue with metal and stuff, then of course, maybe that blackness is actually kind of aluminium and seal kind of just kind of getting mixed up in the brake fluid. And that's perhaps what's causing that strange coloration. And of course, also the fade. Clearly, we are clutching at straws here a little bit, but it's a very intriguing I think problem. you could have picked a better question. <laughs> <laughs> that may be the case, but something else to think about as well. The car this, might be too old for this. Do you realise this, this whole question is a complete ask Ed? Yeah. Just this question that's on good. its own, without that's, anything else. That's perfect. <laughs> Just this question. Well, yeah, but something else to think about is that I think the car might be a little bit too old for this, but obviously on the more modern cars, 
to bleed the brake system, you actually have to plug it in. And in the case of the Porsche, it's the PIWIS, and that stands for Porsche Integrated Workshop Information System. But that basically takes you through a whole routine where the engine's turned on and off and all that, all the way through the process to make sure you bleed every last drop of air or, I suppose, bubble of air out of the system. So check also that you don't need to do that because that may also mean that you clear out some fluid that's been going old somewhere stuck in the system. I don't know, but it, let us know how you get on with this because it's a very intriguing problem. But start with the 5.1 fluid and make sure that you flushed all the other four out of there. And that's going to give us a fighting chance to find out whether that's a bit more impervious to this discoloration. Very strange. Yeah, please question. let us know how you get on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, I feel like we should probably move on to the top tip of the week. So we have two top tips that are kind of based on the same thing. Basically, okay. I've been told off for my oh, well, dodgy wiring. What have you done now? Boat. Well, because I use spade connectors on the boat on that wiring uh, for the bilge pump. And clearly, I should I know, because something. they've got a short life, haven't they, bilge pumps? So it's easy with spake in it. Well, that's what I figured, but obviously at the end of the day, it, yeah. yeah, I wasn't the right thing. And also, really annoyingly, I forgot to turn one of the terminals around as well, so I couldn't get connect it incorrectly either. But there's a top tip here from Roderick Bizet, and uh, his tip is marine connectors for boats, always spades are for the garden, which is a very good point. Oh. And then a similar question, or comment, I should say, really, from Dale Cunningham. Best practice in marine wiring is to use waterproof connections for the bilge pump. Neat project. I love woodies. Well, there we go. So thank you for both of those. You're dead right. And actually, there are a number of different ways you can make those connections waterproof. You can obviously get the kind of automotive ones with all the little kind of rubber seals on both ends of the wire and all that kind of stuff. Or you can even get these groovy little things, which are basically heat shrink. But if you look inside, you can actually see this little bit of solder. And it's quite cool. So what you do is you just thread your wire actually all the way through out the other side. And then... You just kind of connect the two together and you kind of just do your magic twisting. So you just twist them up to they nicely connected. And then you pop that back into the center and then get yourself a heat gun. So it's quite groovy. So it just works just like you'd expect a normal heat shrink. So you can see it's now just shrinking down on both sides. But what's really clever is that the solder is designed specially so it actually melts with the heat of the heat gun. Right, you can see as soon as the solder sort of flows into the wires, you know you've got a really good connection. So there we go. Yeah, not, not too bad. I think I'll prefer the normal, you know, solder two wires together with the heat shrink on. Yeah. And okay. may, maybe, you know, the heat shrink with the adhesive in. Definitely. Just to be, a much better seal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's another alternative, although it's very hard to undo again when you want to change the bilge pump. Lovely job. <laughs> Quick cup of tea, and then I need to uh, get back onto my Chevy trucks. Well, I really should get on with that mini as well. Okay. Cool. Well. Let's do another tea anyway. <laughs> so the valve timing or the tappets are now done. The rocker cover is back in place with a brand new gasket. The next thing is to pop in the spark plugs. But before I do, I'm just going to check the gap. Now, normally on a Mini, it's somewhere between 25 and 30 thou, and because I've got electronic ignition now, I can probably afford to go to the sort of slightly wider end, and that translates to just around about 70 or 0.75 millimetres. So I'm just the same sort of thing with the feeler gauge on the tappets. So just looking for that nice, slight drag. Same thing on this one. It's pretty good, actually. Ooh, that one's a little bit loose. So I'm just going to use the engine just to get a little bit of a tap. And the idea is to try and compress that slightly. That's much better. Cool. So that's good. And then the last one. Again, ideal. So now I'm just going to give it a little bit, tiny bit of a clean just before I put them back in. They're actually in pretty good nick. So I could just pop all the spark plugs back in. I could change them, but to be fair, I barely use them, barely run them in. So they're good for a fair few miles yet. So we're now sure that the valve timing is all in order. I've also checked the gap on the spark plugs, that's okay. So now we need to have a look at the rest of the ignition system. Now I mentioned earlier on that I actually fitted an aftermarket distributor some months ago. So I'm pretty sure that timing's okay, but I just want to double check before we go any further. 
Now normally on a mini engine, you normally have this little timing mark, little arrow that points to the bottom pulley so you can actually see where the TDC or top dead centre is actually positioned. On this particular engine, slightly awkwardly on this particular configuration of car, actually the timing mark's on the flywheel and you can see there's a little hole, observation hole, just at the top of this bell housing bit here. So I'm going to have to kind of get a mirror and actually kind of work it out via the strobe light in, off the mirror, if you like, onto the timing mark, and of course I'll see what's going on. And once I've checked that, at least it will then know that these systems are all in order. So let's fire it up. Is really lovely so that means we now have 22 degrees at 5,000 rpm with the vacuum hose off and that means our ignition timing is spot on and having established that our mechanical valve timing or the clearances are also spot on that means both of those things can be eliminated from our inquiries so the next job is to go back inside and start looking for leaks in the fuel air system but that is a job for another day <laughs> see ya Thanks for stopping by the workshop. If you enjoyed the video even just a little bit, then click like. If you hated it, well then click like three times. Also remember to leave your thoughts and your questions in the comments. And obviously we'd love to see you again soon, so please remember to click subscribe if you haven't already, and click the bell for notifications of when the next video is published, or when I have some intriguing news.